Hello and welcome to the West London Sport QPR podcast. We're back finally and we've obviously got plenty to talk about since we uh, recorded our last episode. Uh, I'm Dan Bennett, of course. I'm joined by the usual lineup of Ian McCullough and Kevin Gallen. Uh, I mean, those that follow me on Twitter might have already seen that, unfortunately, because of other work commitments, I'm having to step back from the podcast. But um, they've twisted my arm and got one last pod out of me before I uh, before I leave. So, but yes, this will be my last one. So I'm going to uh, hold back the tears and um, I'll take any Mick Beal jibes uh, on the chin. I think they're, Dan, they're Dan, well warranted. Are you going to do a Mick Beal and go, you're going to become Daniel Bennett now in your new job? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go every day and wear a suit. <laughs> now, 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 Michael, call me Mick Beal. He's back to he calling himself. I'm Michael. Now he's manager of Glasgow <laughs> Rangers. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the Mick Beal method. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, all right. We'll start with, uh, we'll start with Reading. Uh, Ian, you were there too. We'll draw more positives or more negatives from this one. Do you think, or was it about equal? No, I think there was more positives. I mean, it couldn't, you couldn't go any lower than the Fleetwood performance, which is as bad as a performance I've seen in a very long time. Um you know they're actually with the better side throughout really and um you know found themselves 2 0 down as you know Jeff Henrik did something he never ever did at QBR and found the bottom <laughs> corner from about 25 yards with a, a very good strike and then um the second goal really ranges their own corner and sort of lost the ball and read him broke and very preventable goal really and he he taps it in but you sort of felt like well, if they get one goal back they'll probably you know get something out of this and um they got a massive break really in the second half where Rob Dickey got on Shane Long got on the wrong side of um Rob Dickey and he, he you know he, he fouled him in the box and it looked a penalty all up to me and I think most people on the ground and the referee didn't give it and that was a sort of a a big break, and then Jamal Lowe coming off the bench looked really good when he came on. First touch, he sets up Tyron, um, Tyler Roberts, who took his goal very, very well. It was a really good finish. Um, and they got the second goal for the equalizer, and really only one team would like winning it, really. Joe Lumley pulled off a really good save from Lyndon Dykes, um, who played well, actually. Dykes, he had a good game. Um, and then right at the end, they had two corners ready, and you thought, oh, this would be. You know, just rang just luck at the minute the way things are going from that really will nick something here and you know it didn't come to anything. And um I mean you take away two sort of moments in the second half, in the first half the Rangers win that game comfortably and um it felt almost like a well the proof will be in a pudding on Saturday against Swansea, but it did feel like a bit of a rot stopping kind of result. Um when I didn't get the win, it felt like a, a like a winning draw, so to speak. And um yeah, so I think you know, given where they have been, it was a, a positive result. Yeah, good to see Tyler Roberts come on and get a couple of goals as well. Because, I mean, he's sort of like someone who, like, I don't know, kind of found that maybe forgotten about as being like one of the main options this season. But, I mean, when he arrived, I mean, McBeal was obviously talking him up a lot, wasn't he? And saying how good a player he was and how pleased he was to have him at QPR. And he's had all those injury problems, obviously missed the World Cup. But, I mean, Ian, you, I think you've always quite liked him as a player, haven't you? So... To see him yeah, every time I saw him at Leeds, on. not just games against QPR, he always kind of caught my eye. Um, I think he needs to play. I mean, he's had one game in, one game out. He's injured, he's back. He's, he's kind of... And Chris Lee said as much after the game, but, you know, he needs sort of five or six games back-to-back to kind of play. Because, I mean, Kev will tell you more, probably more than I can, that you need, you just need to, you just need to play. And when you're playing regularly and not worried about your body and just feel like you're getting into the groove um you know it can't not help him and you know the first goal was a really good finish it was a you know he's got the ability he's got you know at this level he can certainly play you kind of hope he can kick on now in the second half of the season and sort of get some more goals yeah definitely no he's definitely a player that if he's at his best i think they could really utilize him going into the second half of the season but kev do you share um Ian's kind of optimism about this result and it kind of stopping the rot. I mean, what have you made also of Critchley's time at QPR? Obviously, not no win since the first game he managed at Preston. But um, what what have you kind of made of his spell in charge? Obviously, there's been probably more negatives than positives, hasn't there so far? Yeah, I'd say so. Just because uh, the Fleetwood game was sort of, I didn't see it, but from what everyone was saying was, and from his interview after the game. 
he was uh, he wasn't very happy, was he? So that was a poor performance from what I can gather and a poor result, obviously. Uh, regarding the Reading game, when you're 2-0 down at half-time and you come back in 2-2, it's, you know, that's that's more of a positive. Uh, you sort mm. of end the game coming back from two goals down. If you're a Reading player or supporter or the manager, you'd be thinking, well, we're 2-0 up, we should have won. And you're at home. And so QPR, you know, would take that as a, we should take that as a positive. Um, regarding Critchley, yeah, it's a difficult one for him. He's come in, the, obviously, he's got his different ideas and he's trying to get them across as quickly as possible to the players. But also, when he did come in, QPR were on a poor run. And unfortunately, we, that run is still ongoing because I think, what is it, one win in how many games? 12, maybe? 11, I think it is. 11 games. Mm. That needs to change, and there's no better chance and opportunities. A home game on Saturday against Swansea. Regarding Tyler Roberts, he took his goals very well. Uh, and uh, Ian sort of said about getting in the rhythm of playing football regularly and getting five or six games under the belt. There's nothing worse than, you know, in the back of your mind thinking you've got a little injury here, might be coming. Once you get that five or six, night, six, six games, 90 minutes under your belt. You just get into that rhythm and you get confident. And when you score a couple of goals, it'll be his confidence should be really high. One thing I was always um when I watched uh, Tyler Roberts play is he didn't get in the box enough to score goals. He was always sort of hanging out. Um when he laid the ball off, I would want you spinning into the box to get onto the next one. And on Saturday, he'd done that very well. And I think Ian said that it was a great goal, the first one, but I'd be more pleased that he was in the box for the second goal and getting that tap in. Because they're the yeah. goals you get, the tap you need to get. You're not always going to score worldies. And when I spoke about how Willock was scoring worldies at the end, at the start of the season. And to keep that up and scoring world, really good goals all season is very difficult. One, it's difficult. Two, you probably get a big move to the Premiership if you keep doing that week in, week out. Do you know what I mean? So you need to score these tapping goals, and that's a great goal for Tyler Roberts for that little header to equalise. Yeah, it seems like Roberts is one of those guys who wants to be involved in the build-up more than the final bit. If you know what I mean. Um, yes, you need to get if you want to be a striker. I mean, his goal-scoring record for Leeds and in a team that creates a lot of chances isn't great. He needs to get into the box. He needs to just think to myself. You know, when that ball's coming in the box, getting that six yard six yard area where keeper saves it. Lumley made a great save and then he's, he's following up with a nice simple header. That's, they're the goals you need to get your tally up. Yeah, because I'm not really sure. I mean, we don't really know what he is yet. Is he is he a guy who plays behind the striker? Is he a better player out wide? Is he a striker? Do you know what I mean? I mean, I know he's versatile and that's a strength, but, you know, when you're looking at the striking options, I mean, do we consider Roberts as, as one of those? It's still like, not, not really sure, you know, it's... Well, he's not... He's not your classic number nine, is he? He's no, probably... he's not, no. But do we consider him with Lowe and Dykes now as like a striking option? Do you? Well, I don't think Lowe's a classic number nine like Lyndon Dyke. I must... But, you know, that type of sort of a target man, you know, try and hold it up, win headers. Lowe's more of a running out wide. And uh, before we, we went on there, um, Ian was saying that I think Critchley wants his wide players to come in, a bit like what Liverpool do where Salah comes in and Mane with come, comes in. They play wide, but they literally end up in the middle all the time. So mm. it looks that way. I think uh, Lowe's more, I mean, there's that word hybrid centre forward, a striker, and, you know, Lowe's more of a runner and more of a more hard working, more work rate type than Tyler Roberts would. Tyler Roberts is more technical, was the ball of the feet, and link play pretty similar to like Chair and Willock in that, in that sense of, of style of play. Yeah, definitely. Um, you touched on those Critchley comments after Fleetwood there, Kev. I wanted to ask you about those. I did a piece when Critchley got appointed, obviously, with my kind of insight that I had from when he was at Blackpool and kind of what you can expect from him. I put in there that I can't really remember him ever getting like really visibly frustrated in post-match interviews. He was always quite calm and um, got his you know messages across quite calmly. But you know, it's good to see it's taken him about three weeks and that's gone out the window at, uh, <laughs> at QPR. But uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously, to be fair, it was obviously going well at Blackpool for um, for most of his time there. So I guess he didn't really have a reason to. But I can't really remember him at Blackpool being as strong as he was in that interview after Fleetwood. 
I mean, what did you make of those comments, Kev? Is it a bit like alarm bells ringing? Because, I mean, he sort of questioned their attitude a bit, didn't he? And saying that they weren't ready from the kickoff. They almost conceded from that and then start defending from the corner. And But we have heard it before as well, haven't we? We've heard it from Mick Beal. We've heard it from Mark Warburton. And it's, you know, a bit of concern that this is still going on. Well, yeah, I'm sure it, it, it probably is a concern. Um, it's just sort of, unfortunately, it's a little bit typical QPR in the, in the FA Cup. Yeah, a, a draw that's not really glamorous, Fleetwood, no disrespect. And you sort of see it's come, it's on the cards, really. And that's that's coming from a supporter's point of view, myself. And I'm sure Ian would probably back me up and say that we didn't, I didn't, I, um, that, that result wasn't unexpected in. I mean, you'd expect QPR to put in a better performance, but when I saw, I didn't watch it, but when I saw the result was 2-1, you're thinking, well, that, I weren't really surprised at that result, were you? Because of, of what's happened over, in, over previous years. So, he's, um, I mean, he's dug out a few, he's dug out the players and sometimes that has to be done. And then I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a school of thought thing saying, Oh, you never dig out your players. You always back them in the press. But sometimes, if the performance is that poor, they need to be dug out, and they'll take it on the chin. Because if if you're a player and you played that poorly all round, but hold your hands up and say, "Yeah, he's right. He's correct. That was poor performance." Yeah, seems sorry, go on here. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, absolutely spot on. Because I mean, he he, he was they got Dick Freenio by Luton, and he he was nowhere near as incensed as he was after the, the Fleetwood game. Um, yeah. But the Fleetwood game, I mean, there isn't a single player that in that dressing room that could have sat there and been upset about the comments that he made because it was truly awful. And he didn't dig out individuals. He just dug, dug them out collectively. And mm. um, and they have to, you have to ask the question. I mean, it, it, it's a mentality thing. I mean, you know, say Bill said it, Warburton said as much and, you know, maybe the players do have to look at themselves and think, you know, should they, you know, the first goal of Fleetwood was a abysmal goal. That's like Sunday morning. I mean, and that phrase is used quite a lot Sunday morning defending, but you wouldn't see that on a Sunday morning. It was just, <laughs> it was horrendous, you know, and Dunn and Dickie are two season championship centre backs. So that shouldn't be happening. Um, and just maybe a little bit of arrogance. And I think um, reading between the lines, um, Last season, they the fall away in the second half of the season was largely down to players getting ahead of themselves, thinking, you know, we're in the playoffs, we're going to be in the promotion mix. And I mean, that game at Cardiff, home to Cardiff last year, where they won the lap and sort of a lay in and, you know, showboating and they lose the game 2 1. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the angriest I've seen Mike Warburton after a game, um, that match. He was really furious just because of the attitude about what they did and how they went about the game. And, you, you know, you got to take... Could be aren't a good enough team to be sort of going into games against teams like Fleetwood, just thinking they're going to turn up and win and teams are going to roll over. You know, just because you play well against Sheffield United and, you know, you very nearly got, got a win out of the game, you know, and it was attitude. It was just deplorable. It really was bad. But on Saturday, there was the attitude was a lot better and the fight back was very encouraging. Um um, but that said, you know, they had the two first-choice fullbacks playing in the game against Reading, and that makes a hell of a difference to this team, particularly on the left left side. Yeah, it's going to, like, when I saw the team selection against Fleetwood and the team had named, I, I, I thought he's, he's just asking for a cup exit, aren't you? But it was really weird because he named quite a strong sort of attacking lineup, didn't he? But then the defence, he sort of switched around. I was a bit confused by that. I was thinking... You can't, I kind of think do you either go you either rotate or you you go strong. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of mm. I thought he was kind of asking for for trouble with that team selection. To be honest, another thing obviously, and you wrote a piece for the website about Chris Willock and Critchley talking about um, Willock. Obviously, we touched on there. He's been quite below his um, you know his best recently. He's not been you know we got so used to seeing him perform at such a high level. So anything below that is a bit of a disappointment. But certainly for a little while now, he's not been at his best. Um, but, I mean, Critchley basically saying, wasn't he, that he, he needs a bit of time, he needs some patience and these maybe overthinking things at the moment. Um, do you kind of agree with that? And what were your, your thoughts on those comments about yeah, giving well, him a bit of time? Well, look, how I look at him, he, he looks to me like he's trying too hard, which is sort of a bit of a ludicrous thing to say, really, because you can't, it's 
he's, players are often accused of not trying, but I think he he is trying, but he's just trying to do too much. He's having um, early in the season when he was confident, he, you know, one touch beat a man, mm. lay the ball off. He's having too many touches. It's almost like he's doubting himself and he's getting caught in possession. And, you know, early in his career, you used to see things wouldn't come off and he would like kind of, you could see him on the, himself on the pitch, like admonishing himself and sort of like the old, the old side hand clap, you know, when in frustration and, you know, he'd have defenders roaring at him to get back and stop sulking about losing the ball. And he's not doing that anymore, but he evidently is a player that kind of puts himself under a lot of pressure. Um, I mean, it's a very easy narrative for people to say, oh, well, he's not playing well because he's, you know, he's, he's, he's too busy, you know, looking for another move. And I don't think that is the case. I think, yeah, obviously there isn't a single player in that team that doesn't want to move to the Premier League. Um, you know, if he that was the case, he would be sort of playing out of his skin, wouldn't he? In, in you know, during the transfer window to try and get a move. But I just think it's not taking him out of the firing line. But the difference when Lowe came on 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 Saturday was was noticeable. Um, but you know, and I thought what what Chris he said was was quite pertinent you know he just he's had a chat with him in the week and he's obviously kind of thinking overthinking things and worrying about his game and he just he just needs one to go in something's that happening in a game you know and it will all come back again he's too good a player not to for this to last you know there's that old adage you know class is permanent form is temporary and he's definitely a class player at this level um mm. it's not happening for him at the moment um you know, it happens in football, doesn't it? You know, players lose form. You know, confidence is everything. If you're confident, you're playing well and things come off here. And when they don't and your confidence is down, it doesn't come off here. So, you know, hopefully for him and for QBR, mm. that will that will happen for him soon. And, you know, he's back up and running again. Yeah, definitely. Kev, how did you um, get yourself out of sort of sticky patches and bad runs of form? Obviously not that you had many, you know. Rarely did that happen in your career. Yeah, don't worry, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> um, of that. um do you know what and then it's all about really getting back to his basics as um as quickly as possible and I'm, I'm working hard it's like the, the old saying the harder that you know the harder you work the luckier you get but i can understand that what ian's saying about he's trying too hard taking too many touches i always believed if if you start a game you're not feeling confident the first time you get the ball, get hold of the ball and pass it and grow into the game. When you ain't got the ball, close down, win a tackle, crowd jumps up, everyone's happy. Do you know what I mean? Just try and grow into the game. But there is, it's, it's quite, I think it's a bit of a concern because of the high standards that uh, Willock had at the start of the season to sort of how he's playing now. So the quicker he gets back to form, the better for the QPR on the team and, and moving up the table. But to be fair, you know, Tyler Roberts is, uh, is there. He scored two goals. He'll be full of confidence now. Jamal Lowe has come into the squad and he'll be uh, pushing to start on Saturday. And he gives you something different, a bit more running, a bit more running in the channels, a bit more energy, I'd say. And that doesn't say it will it, but they're different types of player. Well, the first thing Jamal Lowe did was the ball, the ball went forward. They won the head, I think. Chair picked it up. And first thing he did, he just put it over the top. Jamal roll, rolls on. Makes the effort to the effort and the run to to get on the end of it, passes it, and we score a goal. Sort of simple, basic stuff. Where I don't think Chris Willock would make that run because he would want to come and get the ball to feet. Mm. Sometimes you need someone to just make that run and stretch the opposition, stretch the opposition defence, and then come and get it. So if you've got someone who can uh, stretch the defence, you know who's, who, who wants to and he's got the fitness and he's got the energy to run in behind center halves and the defenders always start backing off and then people like uh, Willock and Chair can then come and get the ball to feet. Do you understand? There's more space in that little gap mm. in midfield and the defence. So it'll be interesting to see what Critchley does on, on Saturday. Does he start Jamal Lowe? I think he does. It's just who's going to play, uh, who's going to be the front three up there? Is he going to start with Willock, Jamal Lowe, Dykes, Tyler Roberts? So he's got some good options where I think where with Dykes, he's sort of your number nine player and who's going to play around him. Mm. So he's got some options. Yeah, as you say, that should, hopefully low, in theory, should help get the best out of the likes of Chair and Willock because 
I mean, the, I guess the ball might not stick in that area of the pitch as much as, say, if you played Dykes over low, um, you know, you're going to run in behind. But, you know, him running in behind, hopefully, might free up, like you said, Kev, that space in between the, the fence and the midfield where Willock and Chairs will come into their own, don't they? So, hopefully, that, that will be able to help as well. But, yeah, I do think it's been quite a big factor in QPR not being as good as they were at the start of the season is Willock not playing as well as he was because... I mean, we know how reliant QPR have been on Chris Willock for goals, especially, um, you know, in the last season or so. And the fact he was scoring so many good goals as well, like you said, Kev, they weren't, none of them were really goals you would expect of, expect him to score, would you? I think I said that stat earlier in the year, that XG stat, where I said like expected goals, where he almost like broke the stat. It was like he ex- he's expected to score one goal and he had about six because they were all curlers from the edge of the box, you know? It's, yeah. And when you're not, you know, you, you can't really expect a player to be doing that every week. But yeah, you're right. The overall performance level as well has dipped quite a lot, which I do think is quite a big reason behind why QPR haven't been sort of anywhere near their best for um for a little while, to be honest. Chris, you know, Chris Willett will probably think, sorry, Ian, Chris Willett will be probably thinking now, he's, he's thinking, why aren't I scoring them goals like I was at the start of the season? He will be, because I've been there. You like, you, you'd be overanalyzing and analyzing. Why, why isn't this happening? Why? Why is this? Why is that? And you can go into so many different reasons, and he probably has. And then you've got to go into, is he as fit as he was at the start of the season? You know, the pitch is maybe not as good, and I don't know, sort of QPR last season when it got a little bit cold. I might be just... I'm just I think the opposition as well, though, because he can scored out. so many of the same goal. I think they probably wised up to it and said, right, you do not let him shoot when he's cutting him from the left because he will probably score. And the oppositions are probably... Yeah, you know, yeah. know that as well, I think. So, he'll it, be analysing it and thinking, why this, why that? But the best way is hard work. Get your head down in training. Practice, 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 and just hopefully it comes back. Hmm. But it, it was quite interesting after the game. Critchley said that what Lowe has that the others perhaps don't is a bit more patience and um, his decision making is better. And I think they were guilty of that. They have been guilty of that for a while now where, I mean, Ilias Chairs, again, was worked his heart out on, on Saturday. and But he is guilty of that sort of having the decision making can often be awry where he might take a man on too much or shoot when he should pass or just try and beat that one man too many and um I mean Lyle got the ball beat the man played in Tyler Roberts bang goal and sometimes just the, being simplistic is the best way isn't it you, you know don't don't over complicate it just kind of get the ball in the box and play your man in so hopefully you know his introduction will you know see Rangers you know because they have been attacking wise from where they were sort of last season at the start and early this season, he sort of dried up, didn't he? I think it was like one goal in six or seven games, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, like, yeah, like two in. Score many. Yeah, I can't remember you the exact know. stat, but it was really bad. Like, it was yeah. really poor. But the two they scored in this game, it's the first time they've scored two goals since, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first time since the Wigan game. Long time. Yeah, Wigan. Yeah, probably, yeah. So it's been a while. That was October, and that's when they were top of the league. So Two corners, that was that Wigan, because I was there that game. Two corners. Yeah. Um, really, if you want to win games, you've got to score two goals, haven't you? Like, really? If you're looking at to go out and win a game, you've got to say, well, we've got to score at least twice, especially in the championship, I think. Unless you're, like, really, really good defensively and you can grind out a 1-0, yeah. which QPR can't, really. <laughs> but um, Yeah, I'm sure they know that, and they'll be working on that every day in training. Sometimes, like you're right, and sometimes the ball has to come in the box. And they did that for the second goal. And Ledge really should have scored, shouldn't he? And uh, but mm. they put the ball in the box. You get men in the box, things happen. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you're right on chair as well, Ian. I think like he's a great player to have it in a championship team, isn't he? Like We all know his quality and he's a really good player, but that is the biggest. And the like, managers have said it as well. It's no secret that his decision-making is the biggest area where he's got to improve, where he gets the ball in a dangerous position and he might make the wrong call. I was watching um, Leeds-Villa, was that on Friday, I think? And Leeds like battered Villa for most of the game, but 
two moments, Villa's decision making was like spot on. Leon Bailey knew exactly what to do when he got the ball, um, and that like decided the game. It's it's such a big thing just being able mm. to make. I mean, you're gonna this as well, aren't you, Kev? Like having the ability to make the best decision possible in the final third. I mean, that can decide the game, even if you're not playing well, can't it? Oh, 100%. And the simple ball sometimes is the best ball. Well, usually, yeah. nine times out of ten, the simple ball, get your red up and you see someone in the better position than you. And nine times out of ten, if you pass it, it, it should work out. Yeah, exactly. Um, any more points on the games and on the pitch stuff? Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, both your brothers, Joe and Steve, would have worked with Jamal Lowe. Steve That's when right, he was at QBR yeah. and Joe when he was at Portsmouth. Any insight right. that from from them that you can impart? Yeah, they did. Uh, I, I spoke to Joe today actually, and he said he text he text Jamal saying that you're back home or whatever um, in London. I think he's from Harrow, isn't he? Um, and he just said because yeah, I watched uh, Portsmouth quite a bit when he played, and he sort of played a lot more on the right wing for Portsmouth. But then he went to Swansea and he sort of played a little bit more centrally. So, like I say, I don't think he's an out-and-out centre-forward, but I think he can play there, but not an out-and-out. He just says he's a really good good lad, works hard. He yeah, just says he's a good player. Just good and a good... Yeah, something most importantly for the dressing room, he's a good lad. And he comes in. That's what... When you're in the dressing room and, you, and, and someone comes in new and he's a good lad, he works hard, and you like when you play with someone on a Saturday and you say, oh, bloody, he put, he put a good shift in, he's a good lad. You don't want someone coming in, giving it the big one. And here, do you know what I mean? And <laughs> not putting any effort in and then lads in the change room are like, not having him. So good player and a good lad. So that's not a bad combination. He's he's come up through the leagues, hasn't he, low as well? Ian's dying for those listeners who, are, <laughs> who, are, who aren't watching. <laughs> um but he's come up through the leagues, hasn't he, Low as well. Like, do you know what I mean? He's not yeah, so he's hungry. Like... He's hungry. Yeah. He he probably thinks um that he's left Bournemouth there in the premiership. He wasn't getting a game. He's probably thinking, I need to play some football. I've got what four four months here at QPR. I'm gonna give it my best, get some goals. And then whether he stays at QPR or we, we sign him or he gets back in the Bournemouth team. So so you know, it's a good opportunity. There's no point just playing in reserves when you're 28 years or old, years of age. You need to be playing regular football. And, yeah, I don't know uh, he was as old as that, actually. I'm just looking at his Wikipedia page oh, now. You're right, he is from Harrow. But yeah, I mean... How old is he? 28. Oh, I was right. See, I've done my research, Dan. Yeah, yeah, no, I haven't. You're leaving us, you don't even bother yeah, doing I've, any research. I told you, I've checked out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he'll be hungry because he'll be thinking, I play well here at QPR. I'll either get signed by QPR or someone else will take me who wants to a top end of the championship or I don't know what's happening with Bournemouth. They might not, they might get relegated. They might think, well, in the championship, you know, Lowe's good enough for us in the championship. So he'll be hungry and he'll be hungry to play and he'll be hungry to score goals. Hmm. So it's a decent signing for us, I think. No, I like it. I think he's a good player. That's it. I mean, he was playing for Hampton and Richmond Borough in 2017. So it's not been that long since he's been playing senior, well, not senior, sorry, but, um, you know, professional level football. So well, that, says, really oh, that, that, that sort of says to me that, that he's got a good attitude, that he hasn't given up. Because mm. that's what, five years ago, six years ago, he'd have been 20, yeah, 22, exactly, 23. Yeah. And that's yeah. quite late for when you're 22, 23, you've been playing. And that's yeah. confident. Self, isn't it so that's you know to get in so he, he's he grabbed his chance at Portsmouth and he done well there and he's gone from there so yeah you know, he was well working as a teacher life. wasn't he yeah oh, right. so, I didn't know. He, it says like the mentality of the lad he's 23 he's playing part-time at Hampton Richmond training probably three times a week gets him moved to Portsmouth gets his head down does really well Gets to move to Swansea, does well, gets to move the ball. Well done. So that says to me that he's hungry to do well. And he probably thinks, I know the other side of football where I'm not, I'm only training twice a week. Now I'm a professional. I'm earning good money. Got the facilities. I'm playing in front of the crowds. I want to stay here. Mm. No, definitely. Um, all right, well, I'll come to you first with this one, Kev. I think I know what you might say. I don't know. Jamal Lowe I might change your mind, but. What what are we thinking that QPR need to still do in the transfer window? Get it, and I'm I'm thinking to get 
into the mix for the playoffs around sort of March time. I'm not saying be in the top six, but, you know, just be within a shout of still making it around sort of March time. What do you think? Uh, I would. I still think we're weak on the we're weak regarding fullbacks. As yeah. in, if we get injured, if we get injuries there, then I think we're in trouble. So a hybrid. <laughs> I like this word today. A hybrid. <laughs> well, uh, like who can play left or right? Who, sorry, who can play both? Because I do feel that we're if one of the, our fullbacks get injured, then it will have a big impact on the performance of the team. So, um, someone who could cover left back and right back, but they're hard to come by. And also, I'm going to go for another a number nine. Just another one. Because mm. Lyndon Dyke... I know, oh, I know, it's, I know like everyone's... Oh, we, we, we say it every transfer window, but it's it's hard to argue against it, really. Yeah. And, and I think, unfortunately... I, because of that, I think, uh, well, Macaulay Bond's gone. And it looks like I'm sort of reading between the lines that uh, Sinclair Armstrong needs a loan move. Yeah, well, there's a piece of West London sport, but it's sort of they're, Ian, they're sort of contemplating it, aren't they right? Am I right in saying that? Sinclair yeah, Armstrong? I think so. I think so. Yeah. The benefit of his career, yeah. because he, uh, you just need regular uh, men's football um professional and it would it, be it will it would do well for him it will do it would be great for him so a center forward number nine and a, a left back right back we, we can play as cover but then it's hard to get these players because who who wants to come and be a cover left but left back right back mm. tough no especially in january it's such a hard window isn't it to get things done and to get is an online player you're basically getting loans, aren't you, of players who don't are he playing. Is Ethan Led, so you know you've got to sign him. What happens at the end of the season when Ethan Led goes back, or do we sign? Can we sign him? Does he want to? Does he want to come and keep? We should have a right back. We should have our own right back. Mm. Mm. I mean, they they're in a bit of a bind because they're up to the maximum amount of loans they can have. Yeah, so it might be they might have to make. Or Tyler Roberts or Taylor Richards, there's there's both <laughs> agreements in place to make those deals permanent at the end of the season. So maybe they've got to kind of, you know, make one of those deals permanent now to free up mm. um, space for another loan. But I mean, there's got to be someone in League One, League Two, who's an up and coming defender who's, you know, can play left back. There has to be. There's got to be someone that's better than Nico Hammerlein, and I, I don't want to keep digging the boy out, but you know he he proved again at like Fleetwood that he's just not he's just not up to it. He's just not good enough. Um, there's got to be someone there you can pick up for you know a nominal amount of money that will come in and just sort of back up because Kenneth Powell's mm. done really really well. He's had a really good season, but you know it's it's a it's a, it's a forty six game season and. It's a lot to ask a player to play every single game, every minute of every game, um, because you're very. Well, as well played so like yeah. so much football, yeah. hasn't he? They're playing. Yeah, like, this is the most games he's played in his career, Laird. This yeah, is why like three games in the space of a week, quite often. Yeah. Um, and he's had a, he, he's had a checkered injury um, record in the past. Um, mm. This is why United are kind of keen to keep him at QPR because then he, he he's playing regularly. If he can get through forty games in a season, he's never done that before. Um, particularly in a in a system where you know fullbacks is is a you know it's one of the toughest positions on the park now the way you up and down up and down so you need you do need cover there um, you know Kakai has has had his moments there he's not he's not the worst he's certainly not the best um, you know you fill in and do a job where you can but it's sort of one good game one good bad game with Ozzy sometimes um, yeah. but I'll be I'll be more more worried about getting someone to fill on the left than I would on the right. But, yeah, or at least someone that... But certainly, but certainly Kevin's right. The left back that can come you, you and do, play you right do back. Need, you do need... You do need... They do need to, do need to have their own right back. Because I, I don't think United will, 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 will want to sell Laird. And if they do, um, I, I can I can see a Premier League club coming in for him if he goes. Mm. Yeah, he's definitely... I mean, he's impressed, doesn't he? He's done really well yeah. at QPR. So he's put himself in a really good position. But yeah, I mean, like Kakai... 
I can't remember the, what game it was where he come on uh, or where he started, but he played quite well. Uh, it was the one on, or was it against? I can't remember. It was on TV. Sheffield United. He played quite well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheffield United. Yeah, he played. And he, he had played a stinker against Fleetwood. So it's that. Yeah. Sort of, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like I don't think sort of having him on for sort of half an hour here and there is going to be a big issue. Like I think he can he can do that. But yeah, I, I think fullbacks definitely is an area that they still need to strengthen. To be honest. Um, what? Uh, anywhere else do we think that? Um, that needs to be strengthened. Are we still thinking Ian up? That obviously Ked said up top. Are we still? You still think that's an area? Yeah, where... of course. But it's that old age thing, is it? You know, who's available and what can you get? You know, they haven't got the money to buy anyone, so you're relying on loans. And I've already said, like, you know, you're up to your loan limit, so mm. you have to get something out. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, is there money? QPR always find money. They plead poverty, and then they'll always find money. So you never know, but I mean, I can't see them going out and spending five million pounds on a striker. So it might no, be a case. Of, no. That's not yeah. happen, what happens with Tyler Roberts at the end of the season? Do we have we got a duty to buy him, or is that only because I believe if so? Yeah, I believe so. Um, yeah, was it three and a half million, four million? I'm not sure of the fee. I'm not sure of the fee. Um, I would, I mean, I'm spec, I'm kind of speculating a little bit, but. I would imagine it's sort of their players that were bought on the provide thinking like, well, their succession signings, if Will it go chair yeah. go money from that will be used to sign them mainly. I remember Bill so saying that as well when he brought him in, like after he brought him in. So to speak, but uh, um at the moment, but I don't know whether or not I mean again they're both Michael Bill acquisition, so to speak. So whether or not the new manager agrees he wants them or not we don't know but um so we shall see but yeah i want to yeah what will happen there will be quite interesting yeah it's not ideal having a manager come in who gets loans with options or obligations or whatever it is to buy and then leaving after three months and the new manager has to come in and <laughs> you know has those players there but that's what i think as well obviously chris has only made one sign of his own hasn't he so he's only you know I'm sure there's players in there that he would have quite liked at Blackpool. I'm sure there was there's plenty in there that he, that he would have liked, but you know he hasn't really had time to shape his own squad yet. You know, it's still kind of a lot of it's Mick Beals and Mike Warburton's team, isn't it? <clears throat> really. So, well, they were trying to find that Jamal Lowe. They were trying to sign in September anyway, weren't they? they, they, they right. They okay. Very close to signing. They couldn't get the paperwork done. He's one of those players that like. He's a no. Like, yeah. Managers gonna like, aren't they? He's, yeah. You know, he, for what he does, so you know, it's not. It's only sort of certain specific players, I guess, that managers might not like and sort of styles and things that, that suit their own way of playing. But um but yeah, all right, we'll um we'll move on to our predictions then for Swansea, our favourite team, other than QPR and Blackpool in, in my case. Um Kev, what does uh what do you think of this one? What does um what does Critchley do here, do you think? Um I think I think we'll play Jamal Low. I think he's got to start with him. I think uh, Dykes, Jamal Low, Tyler Roberts. I think he might rest or drop, whatever way you want to say it. Will look. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I just, I think, I think, I've just what I just think. I think it'll be Jamal Low, Dykes, Roberts, and, and Chair mm. uh, at home. You know what Swansea are like. Difficult team to play against. Difficult team for me personally to watch. Just by the way, well, just by the way they play, and you know, sometimes they keep. Not sometimes, most of the time they they keep the ball for the sake of keeping the ball without really going forward. And mm. at the end of the day, I, I, if I was a centre forward playing playing in a team where the, the keeper has more possession than, in, than anyone else, I wouldn't be too keen on that. So I think it's a tough game. I really do. Um, I'm going to, I usually very positive for QPR and go for the win, especially when we're at home, but I think this will be a 1 1. Yeah. Ian, what do you think about um, what Critchy should do here and what, what, how you see this one playing out? Yeah, I, I think what Kev said, I agree with that. I think that's the formation we'd probably go with. Um, you know, Low playing against his former team as well. So that might be another factor in his, in his mind to start him. Um, I mean, they had a really good result last weekend. Um, Swansea 3 1 up at Sunderland. Uh, 
Mm. Some of them have been going really well too. So um, yeah, they got good strikers, Biro and Obafemi. It's um, yeah, it was a tight sort of mm, could have gone either way game at the Liberty early in the season. They won one nil, and the nil nil draw last season that. Loftus Road is one of the most boring games of football I think I've oh, ever watched. God. I it went to that game as well. It was just oh, so God. dull. It was so oh, dull. Yeah. Um, I've got like an great. image in my mind of the keeper near the halfway, sort of not far from the halfway line, and this one, and he's just like playing it out, and he's like really high up the pitch, but they're just yeah, and QPR sort of just sat in. And it's like oh my god. <laughs> uh, but early in like, the season, early in the season, as well, I think. Well, that that game so, early yeah. in the season, they were a little bit more direct than I've seen him in the past. Yeah, I think they have before. changed it a little bit, I, I gather, from what I've heard. Um, but um, I do, I, I think Rangers are due a home win. They haven't won at home for six games, I think it is, or five. We're good. We're good um, again. In the last game they won. So I can I can see him nicking it at 1 0. And, and now I was sort of nervy 1 0. Um, maybe opposite from the game. The Liberty Stadium early in the season. Um, yeah, I think that 2 2 draw up at um, Reading, you know, will hopefully do them some good, bit of confidence going into it and um, get Neil Critchley's home run off to, you know, he needs a win, really. I think at home, he's not won at home yet. You know, they're very no, it would be good for him. United, but if they both did get Sheffield United in the second half, um, <laughs> well, for the first 60 minutes at least, the way they play against Sheffield United and the, the second half was against uh, Reading, then they, you know, they got a good chance of winning Saturday. So, um, yeah, well, yeah, I can't predict anything other than a QPR win, really, in my last one. Can I? So, I, I genuinely think they might might get a result as well. I'm going to say two one QPR. I think I think Jamal Lowe will score against his former club, of course, as well. Swansea played there for a little while, so I can see him getting on the score sheet. And I, I think, like I've said, I think he will play. So. Yeah, I think 2-1. Um, I think that would be a... Yeah, like I say, if you for Neil Critchley get his, uh, his home spell as keeper manager, hopefully get that going because, um, you know, it's not been good at home under him so far. So, um, but yes, but yeah, let us know your uh, your thoughts and um, your comments uh, below and leave a like and subscribe as well, please, if you're watching and follow our feed if you are uh, listening on Spotify. And yeah, as I said, this will be my last episode, but... Uh, been great sort of doing this the last couple of years so thanks for everyone sort of watching and listening because uh you know it's grown a lot and to see more and more people uh coming on and enjoying it and tweeting us and commenting um you know it's been been really good so uh and you're in safe hands with the lads here they're going to uh carry it on and there will be unless qpr play play blackpool there won't be any more blackpool mentions on the podcast so uh that's another good thing as well so uh yes thank you very much everyone and uh yeah thanks for watching and listening mm -hmm. Can I just say before we go, yeah, Dan, yeah. Dan, congrats. well done, mate. Um, it's been great working on you and you've been really good on this pod. So uh, thank you so much. And just from a personal point of view, just want to say thank you very, very much to the numerous messages that I've received and the family of my mate, Aidan McBurray, who, who um, we lost sort of suddenly um, just before Christmas. Um, you know, the Luton game, all his, his two of his three kids were there and numerous people come up to him and just offer their condolences and what have you and it's really gratefully received by everyone and um but yeah messages that i've received on twitter and various other platforms so i just want to say thank you for that and um yeah so thank you yeah well said mate yeah thanks everyone for uh for watching listening i said these two lads will be Jeez, back maybe we'll, Jeez, we'll that, see, you, uh, see you in a couple of years yeah when you're back <laughs> yeah <laughs> 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 Yeah, like I say, I'm hoping I'm still going to obviously keep an eye on QPR and hopefully still get to your game here and there. And, uh, you know, if I go to a game, obviously, uh, I'll come on as a as a pundit and I can uh, give my hard-hitting reviews of uh, of the QPR games with someone else hosting. But, uh, but yeah, no, I'll obviously keep listening and keep watching the pod with you lads on it. And uh, I'm sure it will, uh, will get even better when, after I leave. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing seeing how we uh how it gets on so yes uh thanks everyone for watching listening and these guys will be back again soon